Dear colleagues, welcome to our opening press conference here in CAP Europa in Frankfurt. Please, dear photograph, step to the side so that the main corridor remains free. My name is Matthias Kopp. I'm the press officer of the German Bishops' Conference, cooperating with Britta Bas, press officer of the Central Committee of German Catholics. Um, we are the press spokespersons of the Synodal Pass, which has its final meeting here in Frankfurt. We thank you for your great interest in this last Synodal Assembly. I'm delighted to see 150 colleagues from the media who are present here who have been accredited. Ms. Bars and I and our teams from Berlin and Bonn do our best to take care of you. Um, the editing team will or has been informed, and if you've got any questions, please ask Ms. Elvis from my team. She always knows everything. Two housekeeping pieces of advice. We have a live stream. Thank you. The address is press at synodalaweg.de. You can ask questions to the panel, and we are going to try to answer them in our limited time. Presser at synodalaweg.de. That's only for the external participants. I'd like to welcome our panel, uh, Ms. Stetaka, Bishop Betzing, Bishop Bode, and Professor Söding as members of the uh, Synodal Committee. I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. Gillis and Dr. Frings, who are sitting here at the front, and uh, the man who knows everything from the Secretariat of the Synodal Office. Um, he was in charge of the Synodal Office for four years, and he is head of the Office of the Synodal Pass now, and he's always always available to answer questions. Thank you for being here. Ms. Stedekarp, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear journalists, we are at the beginning of the fifth Synodal Assembly. Some are speaking of a showdown that is now to be expected, others of turning into the home straight. Personally, I hope for the successful conclusion of a phase of decisive change in the Catholic Church. We have taken responsibility for ensuring that the causes of the abuse scandal are taken seriously and that substantial work is done regarding changes. We have identified structural abuses in our church and developed clear concepts on how to change them. Taking responsibility means not hiding, to speak out clearly what it is, and to point out a path that can lead to the future. This is what we have had in mind in more than three years of work. Taking responsibility is not possible without trust. We had to rely on the trust of many people to start our work. And we also need a trust in ourselves that together we can manage to change things. On the path itself, we had to gather ourselves again and again in order not to lose trust in the path. And there were phases of disappointment, of anger, of despair, but also phases of euphoria and a successful cooperation. Now we have to prove that we were worthy of the trust of so many people, that the Synodal Path can come up with tangible results, that it leads into the parishes, into the hearts of the people, but also into the universal church, which so urgently needs change and renewal, as Pope Francis says. We are not alone on our path. We have experienced this intensively, most recently at the European meeting of the World Synod in Prague. We also experience it now almost daily. Italian grassroots movements and communities encourage us with the words, and I quote, it shows that your church is alive and wants to respond to the difficulties and challenges of credibly proclaiming the gospel today. 
We have received endorsements from Ireland, from Benelux, Austria, Switzerland, and other countries. And we are networking as well and as intensively as we can. The Synodal Path has managed to integrate different values, goals, and realities of life. But it has also suffered losses. Individuals have left the Synodal Path. Obviously, the will to integrate and the ability to integrate have limits. For the Synodal Path, it was always clear. Participation follows clear rules rules which were laid down in the statutes and rules of procedure at the beginning. And participation is dependent on working together, on productive dispute, on wrestling with each other, sometimes over content. This is not possibly uh, possible without an open mind and the willingness to represent one's own convictions transparently. And in the end, it also requires the ability and the will to compromise. We will see how much compromise will be demanded of us at this fifth Synodal Assembly. What is important is the goal. We want to make this church fit for the future. We want to make it a place where people are seen. Finally, people, not the church. Therefore, we will and must examine all compromises that will be demanded of us in these three days to see if they serve the people, whether they focus on appreciation, truthfulness, and the perception of needs, or whether they are meant to serve the preservation of existing power relations. We are responsible, each and every one of us. And if this synodal path has taught us one thing, it is this. We cannot delegate our responsibility to others. Therefore, the Synodal Path continues on the 12th of March. It wants to reach the whole church. That is what we are working on. And it is not finished. It is just the beginning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Stedaka. Bishop Betzing, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, this church, my church, deserves of not simply being left the way it is. Changes um, in specific actions that we are looking for want to contribute that the church can fulfill its mission better, to be a bridge, a tool that helps men to meet God again. And we don't give up our trust, that this will lead people to larger horizons and finally to a life in more freedom. That is what we are working on. With great respect, I am seeing the many who, on the request of us, the bishops, are working on this project, have been working on it for three years with a lot of energy, dynamic commitment, the willingness to reach a consensus and who are really working on it. And, and I admit, this kind of energy is something that we, the bishops, sometimes lack. Ten texts. One foundational text, eight implementation texts, and the preamble text are now up to debate and up for resolution. The selection and decision process due to the large demand and uh, the number of ideas was a great challenge. Our agenda reflects the will to achieve real change that is visible at the level of the communities that can be felt by the people. Three years ago, we started the Synodal Path. The uh, German Bishops' Conference and the German uh, committee, Central Committee of German Catholics, a lot of other Synod members are here again today. Back then, three years ago, the focus in church and also in the external public was large. The interest was large, and the number of people present here shows that this interest has not been lost. 
thanks to the courage of Pope Francis, the church, the Catholic church worldwide has stepped up to this synodal path. And I think this is important because it's, it's a question that is pertaining to the future. A church with so many different cultures, experiences, etc. How can we prepare it better for the future? A synodal church, a truly synodal church, is a church that can be viable in the future. So once again, let me say with humility, but also um, with self-confidence, taking into consideration our responsibility, let's get our results and experiences into this global synodal path. I thank you for your attention. And now the Vice President Bishop Bode of Osnabrück. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to see how this assembly is going to be devolved, especially as I'm part of the Forum on Women in Ministries and Offices of the Church. And so I bring very contentious issues to the table. The experience of the Bishops' Conference last week in Dresden is to show that we still need to learn a lot about synodality and that there's still a lot to do for the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I'm positive that we are going to succeed in getting results, especially when it comes to the diaconate of women and for the Ministry of Proclamation. The adoption of the foundational text during the last assembly encourages me to keep the arguments open with regard to the ordination of women to priesthood and the administration of the sacraments. And um, with a lot of tailwind, we are going to bring um, these topics to the table in the Synod in Rome in fall. In addition, we feel and have the support of a large number of bishops' conferences in these matters. This was to show at the Continental Synod of Europe in Prague. And of course, we have also taken note of the statements from Rome, and we are deepening again and again the arguments for a way forward. And we are expecting um, more motions to come during the assembly, and hopefully we can integrate them in a way that Ms. Stetterkamp has just mentioned. We want to make the church viable for the future, together with women and men in all ministries, in all offices, people on all levels. And a church where we focus on people and their faith first, and only then focus on the church as an institution. The experience of the last few years with its ups and downs is a great step forward in synodality, in my opinion, in being church together for the people of today's world. And of course, specific and concrete results are important um, that lead also for our parishes into a rooted way of implementation. But it's also important to um, represent a God that is close to the people. And I'm also positive with regard to the performance Verantwort ich that we are going to participate in this evening in Frankfurt Cathedral. A group of Synod members has prepared that performance with some of those affected. It is to show the unbelievable entanglement of responsibilities that have contributed to the disaster of the abuse scandal of recent years. And it provokes each and every one to stand by their responsibility, including the responsibility to really change something. It's going to be a provocative moment that provides food for thought way beyond the spiritual moments of our path. And it is going to remind us once again in a very forceful way of the reason, the motive behind our synodal journey. Finding appropriate ways to express this responsibility, the responsibility 
that is um, has to be taken on by everybody, you know, and to find an appropriate way to express that was an exciting synodal experience to me. And I hope that we are going to continue to learn and move on. Thank you so much, Bishop Borde the next vice president and the vice president of the Central Committee of German Catholics has the floor. Thank you so much, colleagues. We want to lead the church into a viable future. The similar path of Catholic Church is the way forward because it means more joint deliberations and decisions, new role models of priests, implementation of women's rights, overcoming uh, the condemnation and exclusion of people because of their sexual identity. We chose the right topics. They are important for Germany. And what has become very clear in the meantime, those topics are important to the whole church. And this has become very clear in the preparation of the World Synod, and it was also confirmed at the Continental Assembly in Prague. We have clearly understood that we need to fight systemic abuse at the systemic level. But not only do we have to, we can do it, because Catholic Church is not fixed to the status quo, but it can renew itself from the ground. But however, it has to want that, guided by the Holy Scriptures. It must continue um, the tradition in a lively way. It must interpret the signs of the time, times and recognize the sense of faith of God's people. To do so, we need good theology and we need a magisterium of the bishops that is willing to learn. We are now concluding the first phase of the Synodal Path with a wealth of important decisions, and we are very well positioned to tackle further stages. It has been decided to have a Synodal Commission preparing for a Synodal Council. At the German uh, Central Committee for German Catholics, we have, of course, read uh, the letter to the three cardinals, which, however, was only addressed to the president of the bishops' conference. We too do not know the letter that five bishops, members of our synodal assembly, had previously sent to Rome. We don't know about that letter. And as it goes with poor communication, this is how misunderstandings and mistakes arise. And contrary to the fears that prevail, obviously, in the Vatican, I declare, our decisions do not weaken the Episcopal office, but they strengthen it. For the bishop will be integrated into the people of God. And this has been the open secret of pastoral leadership right from the beginning. And this needs to be implemented in present days. And that remains the mission of the church today. However, when reading things, I ask myself, why do Roman thoughts seemingly revolve only around the, only around the episcopate? Where, is, where are the people of God? Where are those affected in the abuse of power? Why is that poisonous phrase of the so-called systemic causes not withdrawn? We don't have answers to those questions. The agenda of the Fifth Synodal Assembly shows there would be much more to do than what was and is possible in the time available. However, in my perspective, it is a great success of the synodal path that it has revealed the scope of the reform backlog. It has also shown that we need perseverance, not resignation. We will continue. The agenda is also to show that we can now set signs of where the church is heading to in the future. Joint consultation and decision making, opening up celibacy, women's preaching ministry, blessing celebrations for couples who love each other, just to name a few. And on behalf of the entire Synodal Committee, I would like to say that we are united in our effort to set those signs. 
We highly respect the work of the forums. We had intensive consultations and votes in the preparation of the motions for this assembly. And um, I personally would like to underline that I uh, that the results are going to show whether and to what extent the German Bishops' Conference is capable of acting. At the Central Committee of German Catholics, we ourselves commit to the mandate of the Synodal Path to take far-reaching decisions that can really be considered as change and improvement by the people of God in the church in Germany. We do not accept a veto, even though it might be important to secure partial successes at this assembly. We want to and will go further. If texts do not find the necessary two-thirds majority of the bishops, we will clearly state the responsibilities. We will not slacken our energy. We are committed to the conversion and the renewal of Catholic Church. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now it's your turn um, to ask your questions. You know, please um, show your hand if you want to ask a questions. We have colleagues going around with a microphone, Mr. Rauch. We start right here in front. Please let us know who you addressed your question to, to Bishop Betzing. A question on the um, reason for the synodal path. In Liechtenstein, the prosecutors said that they are going to persecute a priest coming from the Diocese of Limburg, but he's not incarnated in your diocese, but he's living in um, your diocese. What can you do for a priest living in your diocese but th that you are not in charge of? in order to avoid things. And what are your expectations to the bishop in charge, Wolfgang Haas? That is a very specific question, thank you. I heard about that. And no, that this priest who's not serving anymore, uh, he lives um, in the area of the Diocese of Limburg because he comes from there. He is not allowed to um, serve in our diocese as a priest, but I'm surprised as well that the bishop in charge until now never contacted me, even though he knows probably about the place where this priest um, lives and who's expecting uh, charges. Uh, this um, is against uh, the procedures that we have in Catholic Church, and uh, this is not okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, please just mention uh, the media you're working for. Next one. Regina Einig of Tagespost. The Synodal Assembly will talk about uh, priestly existence today in the second reading, the implementation text. So none of the future priests in Germany will have the opportunity to participate in this debate. And uh, this raises this, the question how synodal this Synodal Assembly really is. And this is why I ask why, why there's no seminarist in the Assembly. Your question is directed to whom? It was rather a statement. No, it's a question I would like to ask the bishops. Uh, Betzing and Bode, please. Brief answer, please. And while I rather understood that to be a statement, it doesn't prevent us from actually um, taking responsibility and addressing this question regarding the future of seminarists. We've been on the single path for three years now. So somebody who had been appointed a seminarist back then would maybe no longer be a seminarist uh, today. The priest councils are represented nationwide and They have a, a group uh, of um, priests in training, that is, a group of seminarians. And I, I think this has been perceived um, and acknowledged by the Synodal Assembly. So we don't need a second answer, I think. But would you like to add something? I think that they had the opportunity to work uh, in the forum, to participate in the forum. So I think that this question. Um, regarding priestly existence today 
was actually treated with a lot of by a lot of people who um, are directly concerned because there's a large number of members in this forum who are living celibacy. Next question. Um, somebody with a microphone will be coming to your place. My question is addressed at Bishop Betzing and Ms. Stata Karp. The bishops in Dresden held a meeting and apparently there were a lot of last minute motions for amendment, although the time to submit um, proposed amendments was over. Will these motions for amendment be integrated, these proposals made at the Dresden meeting? And do you think that it will be a, a successful endeavor? Well, regarding a few texts that we are going to treat here today, but which are very important. We had a very intensive consultation in Dresden, which resulted in uh, proposals, proposals that um, could be integrated into the second reading. This results from the real willingness to obtain a majority that is also the necessary two-thirds majority in the bishops' conference. However, the Synodal Assembly is the sovereign. So our statutes provide that each of these um, proposals or uh, proposed motions needs to be voted on whether it is to be admitted or not. So we can only ask the Synodal Assembly to take these uh, proposals into consideration by stressing that not only marginal aspects have been changed, but that these are really important motions for amendment. Regarding the procedure, I have nothing to add. Um, it is absolutely legal, so to speak. But we do think that we need to look at the motives behind it. So is it all about having uh, papers um, that have been existing for a long time and to sort of greenwash them? Or is it really um, uh, the good willingness of the bishops' conference to reach a two-thirds majority? We will see how this is going to show in the bishops' conference. But I can tell you, within the past 48 hours, there have been um, editorial changes. We have not been sleeping as well, and we will see what is possible over the next three days. Dr. Ort, please, your next speaker. Stefan Ort of Herda Correspondence. Question addressed uh, to uh, Mr. Stedaka. The forum number one is or has been a central forum in the Synodal Pass. It's called Power and Separation of Powers. So it makes you think about a change in power structures. If we look, however, at the discussion that took place over the past few weeks, how much has the Synodal Pass actually achieved so far? And what do you expect of the next 48 hours? From the very beginning of the Synodal Pass, we as a lay persons actually um, were willing to uh, to comply with the current canon law situation and this is my first uh, answer to your question and as to your question what i'm going to expect until saturday well, according to the uh, current status regarding the text, I do hope that we will succeed, that the question on uh, consultation and decision making will reach a two-thirds majority. And this is a level we would like to keep. OK, just to make it clear to everybody how we are going to proceed, I've got a few names on my list. Ms. Sufish, Ms. Hein, Mr. Schrom, and Mr. Rothweiler, then Mr. Frank, and then I would like to stop 
to close the speakers list because we might have questions online as well. And there's another speaker. Do we have questions online? Okay, yes. Mr. Löbisch, please. Georg Löbisch, Die Zeit, Christ und Welt. Question to Ms. stetter Karp and Bishop Betzing. Ms. stetter Karp, you said that you want to make the results tangible. And maybe uh, you could explain and Mr. Uh, Bishop Betzing could add. Explain in simple word what these blessing celebrations are supposed to look like, how they are going to uh, be organized and what about baptisms performed by non-priests? What are the ideas? Well, I would like to say that with regard to this text, motions for amendment have been submitted as well. Um, motions coming from the General Assembly of the Bishops asking for a change in the procedure that is currently in place. So the idea is to have an evalu uh, um, evaluation uh, with the goal of starting the new practice as soon as possible. And you have mentioned the uh, proclamation tax, right? The questions of um, baptism assistance and other possibilities that could be taken into cons consideration were separated in the text. And it is the Synodal Assembly which um, needs to decide whether it is going to adopt this motion or not. You've been asking for the uh, specific ideas regarding um, the baptism, a baptism um, performed or administered by a lay person, which is possible in theory in canon law under uh, specific uh, circumstances. So the baptism will take place in the um, normal uh, framework with the liturgy of the word. However, without the rites that are normally administered by um, a deacon or a priest uh, within the uh, normal context, then the term um, of a um, blessings celebration does not specify how uh, the formal aspects look like. On the one hand, um, what is important is to respect two people, two persons who form a couple um, that cannot be joined by matrimony, but a couple that requests God's blessing to live up to the expectations of such a couple. And um, the prerequisite is that there is already um, a, there is already a couple. And on the other hand, the text and the liturgy as well needs to uh, take need into account that it's not the sacramental um, celebration of um, matrimony, because this is um, in order to, to bless um, a joining of a man and women. It's a sacrament of the church, and uh, the blessing pertains to these two people and the children um, they are going to give birth to. So uh, the difference needs to be um, noted here, because a blessing is not a sacrament, and it is not matrimony either. Next question, Ms. Heim, please, of EPD. Thank you, Britta, for introducing me. I've got two questions. One question to the members of the Bishops' Conference on the panel. Bishop Bode, you have a new statement as well. Uh, and you, Bishop Bestzing, you said it last week that you have doubts that all texts will be um, received positively, meaning adopted. So which texts, from your point of view, are, uh, so to speak, threatened to be rejected? Maybe due to the lack of your colleagues in the bishops' conference. 
lack of consent of your colleagues. Uh, my other question is for Ms. Stetter-Karp. Let's uh, imagine that we are already three days ahead, uh, Saturday afternoon, the final press conference. What would be a result that you could still be um, fine with, which you could live with? Regarding the question of, uh, you know, I, I told you what I can contribute um, uh, for the forum, women in ministries and offices in the church. Um, of course, one of the challenging points are the arguments regarding ordination of women for a diaconate. So um, many are expecting this question to be further assessed and evaluated, and that um, it could be brought to achieve a positive result when it comes to other um, ministries and offices, um, the priest's office, for instance, it's uh, probably um, more difficult and it needs to be assessed on the level where it belongs. So that would be the level of a um, of a council or a large synod. What is important now, however, is that as many as possible are uh, backing this opening process. Uh, the other question is the administration of sacraments. Um, we had summarized it. Uh, so the uh, proclamation um, of the word is uh, in general accepted. And when it comes to the sacraments, a baptism that is ac actually ruled by the bishops in Germany, and this is going to be more difficult, this question of the administration of sacraments. So it might be addressed again in a process of further discussion. However, we already have um, a mandate to evaluate this within the bishops' conference. And there will be working groups, commissions will work together regarding this question of administration of uh, baptism. So there's already a mandate for it um, to do this work. And uh, this is about the baptism with the rights that belong to it. So. If we look at it like this, so that you distinguish between the uh, proclamation and the word and the sacrament, then I think we can expect that we will find a good way forward. During past weeks, you know, we've seen, and this goes also for the atmosphere probably in our assembly, we've seen that there's great tension due to the Roman interventions and their impact. And this is also seen in the number of abstentions in the voting processes in the bishop's assembly. And I do expect from every leader, from every executive in the church or in the world that they stand by their own convictions openly in a transparent way. So if you ask on Saturday what would I would be what I would be satisfied with, my answer is this. I would be happier if there were less abstentions. And I know that this includes also the risk that some abstentions turn into nay. But, you know, with all the claims and expectations, you know, from all areas with regard to synodality, you know, a lot, of, a lot has been said on synodality. But, you know, we need to turn things into ja, yes, and no. Also in that biblical sense. So, on Saturday, I would feel much better if I knew that there are texts that will be tackled by the synodal commissions. 
that would be much better than uh, the texts being rejected because they did not uh, they don't uh, get a two-third majority and the last aspect the crucial content or the crucial aspect is that on Saturday we know we will continue our path a path that is not going to see its end next week or whenever, but we will continue. And if we do not manage to align on that further continuation of our path, you know, our, all our energy was in vain. On uh, At 2 o'clock, we will start our assembly. So please be brief and concise in your questions. You can continue also to ask questions tomorrow and the day after. And you also have uh, the opportunities to approach us in the meantime. Michael Strom, Public Forum. In Dresden, but also among uh, the expert on canon law, people discussed uh, the open and secret uh, votes. So question goes to Ms. Stetter Karp. Um, you know, how important is the recorded vote for you? Because that might threaten also the result. It is important to me to have a recorded vote because the question at stake is, you know, beyond legislation, because with every statute, you know, you can, can optimize things. And if you ask uh, three lawyers, you will get four opinions. We all know that. The question is, what is at stake? And as a citizen in this country and as a Catholic person, I would expect somebody who has such a broad scope of responsibility taking on that responsibility in an open way. Can you imagine a CEO of a company that size in Germany saying, hey, dear staff, you know, I won't tell you what I'm th what I think. I will not share my opinions. This is inconceivable. This is a complete no-go. Mr. Rohweiler, please hand over a microphone to him. Martin Rothweiler, I would like to dwell on the Synodal Council. The uh, bishops asked, some bishops asked in Rome if they have to participate, and Rome answered that a Synodal Council uh, cannot be set up, and the Synodal um, Way also decided for that. So it, it's about the apostolic structure, the responsibility of the bishops. And if the, so my question goes to uh, Bishop Betzing and Irma Stekestetakaf. And you say that the ultimate responsibility for decision making is not put into doubt. But then the question is taken is if a synodal council or a synodal commission is merely a consulting body or not. Because basically, um, it is, has always been said that the responsibility of the bishops will not be limited. Um, because in the text, it is always said consulting and decision making. We, we really need to clarify things to make sure um, that the bishops can really take a decision and, and vote. I do agree with you, but not urgently. We stated very clearly we want to um, consult and deliberate and decide jointly under the conditions of canon law. So, and that needs a wise discernment. So we got the message. We received the message from Rome. So there cannot be a fast decision because they see the last and ultimate responsibility of uh, bishops uh, threatens, and we don't want to have that. You know, let me just uh, reference my last letter to Rome. We need conversations. We take three years time in the Synodal Commission to deliberate on that, to find a solution that complies with universal church. And also on the universal uh, synodal path, people speak about um, deliberating and deciding, consulting and deciding. So this is a repetitive pattern 
of the claims that partial churches in Europe um, push put forward. So this is going to be the question at stake, how the bishop's authority and the authority of people of God can be merged in a way that they do not threaten or limit each other, but that they enrich each other. This is what I say over and over again. It is my conviction that it strengthens the bishop's authority if we consult and decide together. This is going to strengthen the bishop's authority. Joachim Graf. Joachim Frank, Kölner Stadtanzeiger. Bishop, you mentioned that people left this assembly. There were losses, or Ms. Stetterkamp mentioned that. There would have been the option to have uh, four people replace those who left in order to um, integrate also those affected in the Synodal Assembly. So during your uh, General Assembly of the bishops, this was rejected. Why did people reject that? And what is the reason behind that those affected should not be members of the Synodal Assembly with um, el eligible to vote? It was not rejected that people affected are members of the Synodal Assembly. I would like to underline that. It is about two questions that are at state. It was my desire as a chair that we replace the four um, people. And in a very transparent way, um, also together with the General, General Secretary, I considered how we can draft such a pos um, proposition and I um, brought it to the Bishops' Conference. And then the overall question was, should we really replace those four people? And the Bishops brought forward um, arguments saying that uh, they weighed the reasons why those people left and we should keep those positions open. Let me put it that way. They've opted for keeping those positions open. And then we had to process further um, proposals. And this proposal has been processed. And um, the result was a very tight majority voting for not replacing people. So the question of who to replace the positions with was um, was not open. And people knew my suggestion and my proposal. Matthias Kopp, he's going to update us on the um, online question. Mr. Zenzis, um, we are going to answer a question from uh, the Netherlands. Um, from all the neighboring countries. Um, you have invited many different representatives uh, to uh, the assembly. Um, but from the Netherlands, there was no representatives invited. Or did they just not uh, have they haven't they been invited all neighboring countries have been invited we send out letters of invitation to bishops conferences and also the lay or to the lay organizations but honestly um, ad hoc i cannot tell you why we don't have a representative from the netherlands mr munzman we are going to dig deep into our archive to understand what's behind. Herr der Korrespondent, the question, what would be the consequences of five diocesan bishops not participating in the Citadel Commission? Everybody shared beforehand that they want to um, make their decision depend on the results of this assembly. And Mr. Betzing, you just said the Citadel Assembly is independent. What do you mean by that? In question with regard to the rules of procedures and the content of the Synodal Pass, uh, the Synodal Assembly is sovereign. And the sovereignty ends um, at the end of our, our Synodal Assembly on Saturday. This is where sovereignty ends. And the second part is a, a theoretical individual question. Und ich wäre 
sehr dankbar und würde es sehr, äh, wäre sehr dankbar, wenn alle 27 sich in den Diskussionen, die dort zu führen sind, denn da geht es um etwas, wirklich um viel, wir haben es ja eben, konnte ich es darstellen, da geht es um etwas, mitdiskutieren und ihre Meinung einbringen. Ich würde es sehr bedauern, äh, wenn Bischöfe sich nicht in der Lage sehen dazu, aber es hält den Weg nicht auf. Äh, und auch hier ist ja klar, äh, beim Synodalen Weg ist es so, keiner der Beschlüsse bindet einen Bischof. Er muss vom Bischof übernommen und für seine Diözese umgesetzt werden. Und das gilt ja zunächst einmal für den Synodalen Ausschuss auch. Also das ist der Grund meines Werbens, dort sich einzubringen und mitzuarbeiten. Okay, herzlichen Dank. Ähm, bevor wir jetzt vermutlich alle gemeinsam rüber wechseln zur eigentlichen Synodalversammlung, will ich hier noch kurz erwähnen, dass die beiden Generalsekretäre, Frau Dr. Gilles, und Marc Frings zu den Demonstrierenden nach draußen gegangen sind. Deswegen sind sie hier zwischenzeitlich ähm, aus äh, dem Raum verschwunden. Das liegt an den wichtigen Kommunikationen, die es da gab. Wenn Sie jetzt rübergehen, gerade der Hinweis an die Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die Bild machen. Sie können sich vor Beginn der Synodalversammlung ähm, ganz normal locker bewegen im Saal. Wenn die Synodalversammlung begonnen hat, bitte Bilder Film von der Seite aus. Wir, Matthias Kopp und ich, sind da und werden Sie gerne begleiten vor Ort. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank an das Podium und einen guten Start der eigentlichen Synodalversammlung. Oh, ich war gar nicht an. <lacht> <lacht>